All right, Claudine, please. All right. The way we were going to do the format, we were going to take 30 minutes and let her talk about what she thinks the state of politics are right now, why this is the most important election of our lifetime, and then we're going to try to leave a lot of time for the question and answers. Okay? All right. Great. Thank you. And for those of you who have phoned in, if you're not familiar with the Moxie Exchange, please make yourself familiar because it is an awesome organization. And Wendy, I thank you for going through the effort to pull this together because, um, excuse me, one sec. <coughs> as I had said when we first met, and as I continue to repeat, I sincerely, sincerely believe that this is the most important election in our lifetimes. And I don't care if you're 90 years old or 20 years old, this is it, ladies. And there may be some gentlemen on here too, but the reason that it is such a critical election, and I should tell you first that I am a registered Republican and I served in Congress from 1980 to 1990 um, as a Republican. So I have insight that a lot of other people do not have. But I also believe in justice and fairness and truth and transparency. So I am 100% working for President Obama and have been and also working to elect a Democratic Congress. And as I proceed, I'll give you a few of the reasons why. But um, oftentimes people will ask me, because I do different types of training, and sometimes I train nonprofits how to lobby Congress and what's the best way to frame your message and who should be in the room, blah, blah, blah. But at any rate, <laughs> um, I think that it's real important to look at people's motives. Why? Are they running for political office? When I told my parents I was going to run for Congress, their first reaction was more like, oh, our little princess, why do you want to get involved with all those crooks and bums? Well, the reality is that this year there are more women running for public office, the House and the Senate in particular, than ever before in the history of the United States. That's a good thing because in 2010, when the Tea Party had their great win, it was the first time in history that women realized a 30% decline in higher office. So this is not a trend, this is tumult, tumultuous. And um, in order for us to realize that we don't make this a trend, we have to, number one, vote today, anybody that can do early voting, Make sure you've done it immediately. Here in Colorado, I learned that 6,000 more Republicans have already voted. And, of course, they may have been counting my vote because I'm registered Republican but voted Democrat. Um, but let me get back to motive. When I was first elected, I was curious. I was in a little gathering of some of the women from the House, and I just sort of blurted out while we were killing time. I said, why was it that you decided to run for Congress? And Marge Rockema from New Jersey said, you know, I was so frustrated with education. I really felt that we needed more guidance from the federal government to help us figure out how to become the best and the brightest internationally. And then I asked another woman who was sitting there, and she said, well, I had been involved in mass transit in California. Bobby Fiedler was her name, and she said, that's why I decided to run. I wanted to make sure that this country wakes up and starts doing more on mass transit. We're waiting, wasting too much of our trade deficit on foreign oil. We're wasting too much of our environment on uh, carbon emissions. We need more mass transit. So it was like that one after another after another among these women. What they had in common was, was that they were all interested in solving problems and they saw that these problems could be solved on the federal level as well as the state and local, but they saw the role of the federal government and its importance. So then I thought, well, that's all curious. All of these women, were, we are all problem solvers. So I thought, I think I'm going to ask some of the guys what motivated them. The first guy I asked said, well, you know, growing up, my father ran office and my uncle was involved in politics and you know, I used to go out campaigning with them, and it looked interesting, you know, so I thought I'd do that. And then I asked another guy, and he said, yes, 
I had always thought that, you know, once I had become president of student council, I would run for town council, and then I'd run for state legislature, and then I'd run for Congress, Senate, and maybe even the presidency someday. What does that define? That defines a career path. That defines ego gratification and power, does it not? So there's a real distinction, and there has been research I was happy to find, to back up my own personal inquiry, and um, a lot of this research does point out the motive, but I think motive is important. And when we look at the current president, what did he do? He went and he studied law. And why did he do that? Because justice was his bottom line. He was involved in community organizing. He believed that, that various communities needed to have a voice and to participate in democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And his opponent, well, obviously his goal was to make money. And of the many wealthy people that I know, once you've achieved more money, more toys, more things, you suddenly think, well, now what? Why don't I go for power? And I am sorry. I feel that you know this is the only reason that this guy is running for the presidency. So another thing I want to do, aside from sharing motive with you today, is do a little civics lesson reminder, which I'm sure you all know this, but the media has forgotten it, the president and his challenger have forgotten that, and that is our founding fathers created three branches of government. They created the administrative, which is the president and all the federal agencies. They created the Congress, which is the Senate and the House. And then they created the judiciary, which is the Supreme Court and all the other courts. The reason being three branches to have a balance of power. And the way it works in Congress, you're getting it straight from a congresswoman, what the, the saying was inside the beltway was the president proposes, meaning the president only has the power to create a draft budget, to put out a vision, to present a plan on tax reform or whatever. And I have to tell you, sometimes presidents don't do that because they leave it up to the Congress. But inside the Beltway, the saying was, the president proposes, the Congress disposes. The Congress is to deliberate any ideas that come from the president or from themselves to figure out what is the best approach, what will be in the best interest of the American people. And so, unfortunately, so many of the campaign ads now are saying, well, President Obama created this deficit, and I am going to do cut taxes, you know, and this and that. Taxes are not within the purview of the presidency. They are the responsibility of the Congress. So please spread the word to everybody that you talk to to point out the fallacy. And I'm hoping that after this election I can work with the media because this is where so much of the fault lies. They're just repeating what the charges are and they're not saying, well, wait a minute, you can't do anything with taxes. You have to you know, propose an idea, but it doesn't guarantee you'll do it. So um, I think that that is critically important. So the other thing I want to mention is let's step back and see where we are as a society, as a country, as a planet. And um, I have been the keynote speaker at the World Future Society. It was one of the largest audiences I ever spoke to. There were 3,000 people. And what was interesting to me is from that came a whole lot of consulting business. And I never said, oh, I'm a futurist or this or that. But I do seem to be able to call the shots. I mean, I did know that the auto industry was going to bite the dust, and I did foresee long ago that we were going to have an obesity epidemic. Um, but there are many other things that, that I have done that have proven to be on target, and this is one that I, hasn't been much discussed, and that is if you step back and look at the agrarian age, this was a time when a transition was moving to the industrial era. Well, what was that little vortex in between agrarian and industrial all about? It was chaotic. It was transformative. There were young people who were working on farms that suddenly decide to go to the cities and work in factories, be exposed to pollution, you know, making more money, getting an education, 
families were being ripped apart. There was a lot of, of chaos, both societally, economically, and on many other fronts. Well, I maintain at this point we are right now in that vortex as we're making the transition from the industrial era into the clean tech era. And that clean tech era is characterized by the innovation that is particularly taking place here in Colorado, but also all across the country. And that means all renewable energy, we are moving into that domain, the fuel efficient cars, a whole broad spectrum of medical devices that are focused on prevention, and a whole number of things that, you know, if we connect the dots, we'll see, wow, we're moving into a, a new world, a new kind of world. So I think it's particularly important to see where we are right now and modify some of our expectations. And that gets me back to what much of the, this current campaign is all about, and that it, are the charges that, oh my gosh, here we are. A president um, is elected and employment goes downhill. And the, everything is being blamed on the president. The reality is, is that when um, 2000, during 2008, uh, President Bush at the time and the Congress had passed a number of different pieces of legislation. And the majority of Republicans, I want to highlight, voted yes to the Bush-Cheney January 2008 stimulus bill. The Republicans also supported the Bush-Cheney bailout of Bear Stern, AIG, and the TARP program of both 2008 and 2009. So this particular recession was well underway in 2008 and 2009. But what is interesting, when the president took office in January of 2009, on January 20th, 88 Republicans in Congress pledged to obstruct and block President Obama. This is all documented in Robert Draper's book, which is entitled, Do Not Ask What Good We Do and it's inside the House of Representatives. And he documents that during a four-hour invitation-only meeting, Paul Ryan, Newt Gingrich, and the assembled Republicans who were elected to represent their constituents instead chose to pledge to sabotage the recovery with their obstruction of every Obama move, from appointing government officials, and if you can think back four years, remember how slowly those appointments were happening while well, the Congress wasn't willing to approve them. And this also went so far as to obstruct the President's American Jobs Bill. Now, for those of you who live in Colorado, it doesn't take a whole lot to remember when we had the massive fires that happened around Colorado Springs, around Fort Collins, all around the state. What happened? But the community turned out on force to provide shelter, to provide food, clothing, tools, all kinds of things. When we had the theater shooting not too long ago, the number of people that came together to support those individuals was awesome. Well, here in 2009, we have thousands of people losing their jobs, losing their homes, and yet 88 Republicans that were elected to Congress refused to do nothing now, I gotta tell you, that is about as unpatriotic as I've ever experienced. That is outrageous. So, the thing that I think we need to remember is that this gridlock, and some of you may have seen the polls, I mean, I have a, a chart here which I think is particularly terrific, where it shows that the uh, approval ratings of Congress in 2011 according to a New York Times CBS poll, were 9%, which were slightly, well, they were exactly the same as the approval for Hugo Chavez, and 11% um, of Americans said the U.S. going communist was a more popular idea than was the U.S. Congress. So this is Oh, and then Paris Hilton even got a higher rating than the U.S. Congress. Paris Hilton got a 15% rating in that poll. So 
Congress is really the problem here, but yet all the blame is being put on the president. And I have worked with presidents, President Reagan, President Bush Sr. would invite me over because I was able to build coalitions of Democrats and Republicans to move bills. And if I didn't agree with them, I told them so, and I said, you know, I can't do this. I don't support it. But the bottom line is this Congress has forgotten who elected them. And I think it's time that we, as women, remind those members of Congress that we are the people that they are to be taking care of, protecting. And this whole banking crisis, I will, I will tell you, I got a call from a friend who said she had a friend who just moved to Colorado, and uh, she got a divorce and she lost her house. Well, I met her for no reason but just to be a friend, and I found out she was living in a vehicle with a nine-year-old daughter. And I said, come move into my house. I mean, this is what Americans are all about. And I myself got furious with the banks but it was because George Bush Jr. had minimized the regulations on the banking industry. That's why we had that, that crisis. And when you remove regulations, you see a whole lot of greed and a whole lot of absence of concern for your fellow man and woman. So it is this removal of regulations that we need to be careful about. And the entire time that I was in Congress, the Republican Party continued to say, we got to get rid of the EPA. we got to get rid of the Department of Education. They're just bureaucracies that are in the way. Well, I have to tell you, as a young girl growing up right outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my job every day in order to earn an allowance was to dust the house. Now I ask you, how dusty could a house get? Well, living right outside of Pittsburgh, near the coal mines and the smokestacks, it would get pretty dusty. And then my parents wondered, why did our daughter at age 25 get cancer? Well, that's why I started putting the, 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 connecting the dots and moved to Rhode Island where I was elected to Congress, but my husband was the director of research for ocean pollution. Um, and it was very interesting because he would pull out these fish with warts and, and ugly colored orange scales and different things. And it was because in Rhode Island, we were dumping our waste from the jewelry industry, from the auto industry, into Narragansett River. The lobster fishermen and others were pulling out those fish, selling them, we were eating them. Rhode Island had the third highest cancer death rate in the nation until I ran for Congress and started saying, folks, you know, what goes around comes around, and we have to take care of this planet. So many of you may have seen that this uh, presidential candidate and this Congress is very opposed to any kind of serious uh, science. And so uh, when we get to climate change, which has been my issue, and I had introduced the Global Warming Prevention Act in the 1980s, which was a 12 program as to the various areas that we needed to address, everything from transportation to making our government buildings more energy efficient. Um, parts of the legislation passed, enough to get the Energy Star program so that now when you all buy a refrigerator or a washing machine or whatever, at least you know how much energy you're going to be wasting or you know using wisely. And a couple of other pieces passed but it was more as a template to say, guys, this is the way we need to move. Pick up any one of this, take this bill as your own. I have no ego here, but let's pass this legislation. So at any rate, uh, member after member are denying science. And as one congressman said, we don't need science, we've got the Bible. Well, to me, this is a very dangerous signal. The other thing is, is the gender gap. When I was in office um, and George Bush Sr. was running for election, they came to me and they said, Claudine, good news. Um, we have figured out how we're going to close the gender gap. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, we have a candidate that looks just like Robert Redford. Well, I have to tell you, I was so insulted <laughs> that I could not believe it. And I said, well, who is it? And they said, well, Dan Quayle, 
And I said, Dan, who? Who is he? And they said, well, don't worry. He looks like Redford, and he's going to help us win. Well, I hate to say it, ladies, but it's been downhill since then. And when I saw a black woman at the Republican National Convention and a Hispanic woman speaking at the Republican National Convention, it just made me realize that, you know, how far can you really push hypocrisy? It's time that we call, call it for what it is. So, the, um, it, to me, I cannot imagine how any woman, any African American, any Hispanic could possibly vote for anyone but President Obama. And when I've watched him since he got elected, I am blown away at how much he has been able to accomplish despite the Congress. And, I, and my intention is to find out how many executive orders he has used, because it seems to me his intention was, well, if these people are going to create a roadblock for me, I am going to go down fighting, and I am going to push for all of those things I know the American people believe in. And I think that that's exactly what he's done. So let me conclude my remarks right now. Oh, there's one other thing. When I mentioned um, the African Americans, some of you may or may not have seen this, but it was in the Washington Post article um, that a friend sent to me. Washington Post, August 30th of this year. Um, it says, on Tuesday at the Republican convention, two delegates threw peanuts at an African American CNN camera woman and said, this is how we feed the animals. I mean, to me, that just makes me sick in the stomach. So, you know, you might have a Condoleezza Rice up there giving a speech, but if you've got the audience doing things like this, then we have to know what we're dealing with. And when it comes to moderate Republicans like myself, we are now extinct. Senator Luger was brutally defeated. Um, Arlen Specter recently passed away, and he was a friend of mine, and Senator John Chafee from the state of Rhode Island, a strong environmentalist, but so stressed out. Jim Jeffords from Vermont. I could name member after member. Olympia Snow, I had dinner with her. Um, she announced she was quitting on a Monday. We had dinner on Wednesday. We're the same age, and I looked at her, and I thought, oh, my God, Olympia, you look so beat up. You know, what happened? And she just didn't want to talk about it. She said all she wanted to know is, if there is there life after Congress? And I said, absolutely, there is life after Congress. But um, she just could not stand the confrontation that she had when she was trying to represent her people and the people of this country and our gender. So the final thing is that when I was doing some of this research, one of the things I did was to contact the Congresswoman's Caucus. So you know what that is. Uh, women in Congress had a bipartisan, nonpartisan research institute that when we had bills that would come up related to women, like women's economic equity, for example, they would do the research on it, pull the studies together, provide the data to both the Democratic and Republican women. I worked with Pat Schroeder there, Geraldine Ferraro, all of those ladies, and together we were able to move legislation and bring on our men to support us. Well, I got a call on May 23rd of this year from a reporter who said, we wanted to ask you a few questions. The Republican women just held a press conference because they decided to pull out of the nonpartisan caucus and form their own Republican Women's Caucus. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Even more fractions going on at a time when we need to pull this country together. I would have expected women to rise above this partisanship and help move us forward. And he said, well, I want to run this by you because I checked the voting records of these Republican women, and this is what I've found. On the legislation called Violence Against Women, of the 24 women, 22 voted to roll back the Violence Against Women Act. No Democratic women voted that way, only the Republican women. The second legislation, access to contraception, 21 of the 24 co-sponsored the, quote, Respect for Rights of Conscious Act 
to take away regulations enacted under Obamacare requiring most employers to cover birth control in their health insurance plans without additional cost sharing. And 21 of the 24 Republican women voted on that. The Lilly Ledbetter <coughs> Fair Pay Act, I hope all of you know what that is because I have to tell you it's been 30 years that we have been pushing for the right of women to file a lawsuit if they learn that they are in the same job as a man and receiving less than the man is. That was the first piece of legislation President Obama signed. Of the 15 Republican Congresswomen who were present, now maybe some of them decided to walk, which is also a, a legislative technique, of the 15 that were present, all 15 voted against the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. And the Paycheck Fairness Act, 13 of those 15 also voted against the Paycheck Fairness Act, which would update the 1963 Equal Pay Act by closing many of the loopholes and strengthening incentives to prevent pay discrimination. And then finally, the last bill that this reporter shared with me was reproductive health. According to Planned Parenthood, 20 of the 24 Republican women earned a zero score voting against all reproductive health at every opportunity. The average score for the women was under 6%. So, so much for the Republican Party and women. So I hope you will share this information. Uh, Wendy told me, Claudine, you ought to put up a Facebook and mm -hmm. put some of this information out there. If you think it will help, I can scramble to do that today. And then you can have some of your friends who are on the fence maybe look at these documented pieces of information. But um, this is the most important election of our lifetime. I think most of us know there will be at least two new Supreme Court justices. Um, there will certainly be elements that relate to women. In addition to that, I am so sick of Republicans saying, well, we're going to eliminate regulation. Oh, except for regulation of women's bodies, we'll re remove other regulations. This is craziness. So. Uh, ladies, I already voted. I hope all of you who are listening, uh, we in Colorado have the opportunity to vote early. Um, others of you may or may not, but please, please, please vote as soon as you possibly can. And on that note, I am happy to take any questions. <laughs> I'll start with one. Okay. Um, I, I don't believe Obama's done everything right. I do have serious issues with the alternatives we have. Um, do you see that? Do you see that there are some things that, I mean. Oh, yeah, absolutely, I mean, because we have to choose one or the other. And so we have to weigh, yeah. you know, what to us happened to be most important. Right. So you may not agree. And let me say something about Obamacare. It, it was like my Global Warming Prevention Act. It has lots of different pieces. It's passed. But as we move through time, we'll find that there are imperfections there, and it will be adjusted. But the fact that this piece of legislation passed is miraculous. Mm -hmm. We're the only industrialized nation in the world without comprehensive health care. And i got to tell you, as one who hardly ever has to see the doctor, even though I had cancer twice, um, I have seen many people who are in dire need, and these are not that 47% that Mr. Romney refers to. These are people in, in dire need for one reason or another. So, um, no, I don't agree with everything President Obama said, but we better look pretty clearly at what the consequences would be of choosing anybody but him. I mentioned the international arena, too. I just want to bring that up because... I have been to 56 different countries. I, when I talked about foresight, I studied Chinese when I was just graduated from college because I knew China was the future. And I speak French and Spanish and, you know, can fake it in a few other languages. So I've, I've been around. And I've been around as both a government official and also a delegate for various organizations. And I am very concerned when this Republican says, we're not going to cut the defense budget. 
And I worked very closely with the military. And these guys know, as I said, we're in that vortex of transition. We're not using those old battleships anymore. We're moving into a high-tech era, and we have to adapt to be lean and, and strong. Um, but half of my family lives in Belgium, and this past year I was in Europe three times. They're terrified of, you know, the loose talk of Mr. Romney when he says, well, Palestinians don't want peace. You know, what is he thinking? So it's not just the man in charge, but it's also the Republicans in terms of the budget. Why do they not want to cut that? Could it be, as Eisenhower had forewarned us, beware of the military-industrial complex? Now, I represented electric boat, you know, which made the submarines. And I would tell these guys in advance, look, you know, strategically, we don't seem to think we need that many. And it'll mean you're going to have to lay off some folks, but let's figure out what else they can do and forewarn them in advance. So this is the way, you know, we have to look at foreign affairs and our military readiness. I can also tell you that during the George Bush Jr. years that the um, State Department budget was decimated. They do not believe in talking. Remember how the president was criticized because he was going to sit down, reach out, shake hands with everybody? <coughs> around the world, well, that's what you do in diplomacy. You build bridges of understanding. And, you know, I won an Emmy during the Cold War because I said we have to reach out to the, to the Russians, to the Soviets, at a time when President Reagan was referring to the Soviet Union as the evil empire, and I was receiving classified information and waking up nights thinking, oh, my God, are we going to have World War III? So ABC agreed to do a live and unedited TV show, and we built this bridge of understanding. And it was pretty interesting because when I went to Russia afterwards, it was like people recognized me on the street. <laughs> this is what diplomacy is about. Now we have some of this technology to build greater diplomacy, and that's what the Irish Spring is all about. All about when people see what democracy is, is like. <laughs> They, they want to get on board. Now, we have to clean up our own act because I hardly think that we are the model at this point. Um, so that's it. <laughs> any, um, any questions on the bridge? Hi, Hi Claudine. Claudine. Go ahead. Uh, this is Maureen berkner Boy, and I apologize if it sounds a little funky. I'm actually calling in from Spain. Um, my... Larger question, Claudine, is, and it's actually fascinating to watch this election from abroad, um, because you would think that the way the, the press uh, talks about it, that we live in a dictatorship because our president really controls everything. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about both candidates here. It's, it is fascinating. My larger, longer range question is, how do we change the dialogue? I'm you know, post-election, we are a country that is so fractured, and I don't know how we get back to civil discourse. Um, and if you've got any ideas there, I think that's really the responsibility that each of us carry as citizens. How do we get back to civil discourse? Thank you. That is a critically important question. When somebody asked me the other day, what are you going to do when you're done working on this campaign? I said, I don't know, but or they said, you know, what office would you like to run for? It was a group of women, and I said, oh, no. I said, I would like to be president of CNN um, or some communications. But um, Maureen, I think your question is something that I'm feeling viscerally that we need to do. And I'm thinking that there are two ways of doing this. I've already started talking to Harvard because I taught leadership there after I left Congress. And um, uh, there was a conference this year, I think, at George Washington University that I learned about too late. And I think that we need to have more conversations about civil discourse, as you point out. And that would be one thing, and start a massive campaign. Perhaps there would be foundation money for us to work with one of the nonprofits to sponsor a number of these, but to do it in concert with women's organizations. Because I think that I keep hearing this from all the women. And I think that 
you know, I'm, I think I mentioned I'm working with Rutgers uh, Center for Women in Politics, and if you go to the website Project 2012, you'll see the progress we've made. But right now, there are 18 women running for the Senate, which is the largest number ever, and 163 women running for the House of Representatives, which is also the largest number ever. Now, I'm hoping that all of them will get elected, but I think that we need to convene and bring in uh, Diane Sawyer and bring in some of the other, you know, uh, Brian Williams and educate them about how government is really run and what presidents can and cannot do. And I'm just horrified that there is so little attention on the congressional races now because if we end up with the same old Congress, which, by the way, I think, I think the proper figure is something like 96% of the time incumbents are reelected. Um, if we end up with the same Congress, we're going to be, you know, right where we were before. So the revolution will have to begin, Maureen, and maybe you can even uh, wave the flag over there in Spain for us. We have another question. Um, yeah, this is uh, Robin Lutz. I'm calling from Wisconsin, and. Um, I noticed on your uh, bio that you had co-anchored the Th Clarence Thomas hearings, and I remember that event as my first political awakening because I remember sitting on my couch till 3 in the morning watching those hearings. And I know that there are no ethics rules that surround Supreme Court justices because they are supposed to act ethically. I am wondering if you have any ideas if there's any way to force Clarence Thomas to either recuse himself from some of these um, uh, cases that are coming up that are so closely aligned with what he's involved in to make him do an honorable thing. Well, my concern is, is that's kind of, um, you know, yesterday's situation that we have a more urgent situation on our hands right now and that is uh, two vacancies, two to four vacancies on the Supreme Court coming up and if we get, uh, when we get President Obama re-elected, he already appointed women to the uh, Supreme Court, imagine what he would do in his second term. So I don't know that we can, you know, really want to fight that fight uh, right now with Clarence Thomas. Um, but I think that, you know, we should be fighting this fight to reelect the president. So, and then we know we don't have to take him any blue binders or whatever, that he'll have his list of women <laughs> judges he'll want to put in position. Next question. Claudia and I have a question. Sandy and I talked about it on the yes. way down here. Um, when you look at the way the campaign has been run, like yes. you brought up some excellent facts today, you know, about the 88 Republicans, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Why does this not come out during the campaign? You know, I just have to say, Obama's campaign people have let us down. Now, I've already voted. Yeah. I, I voted on Monday, so I'm done. And um, I was the early voter, but, you know, really, he yeah. could have gotten a lot more, um, I'm not going to say aggressive, because I didn't like that style between me and Romney. Yeah. But I think he could have been more factually oriented to to put out the facts that would have influenced this election towards more women like us who are concerned about the community, who do want to see, you know, our economy grow. And yet it's all been, and he's, he's, he's fallen into the mud with Romney, you know, like, oh, you're bad, you're bad. That's you're because his consultants are probably men saying, well, get back in there, get back into the ring. Throw and another punch. That's uh, it. And uh, this is what really offends him. That, that if you, you have to go down that negative path to yeah. some degree, too. He did it to, with integrity. Fight, yeah, and I thought he did it with integrity, but, but they were saying that actually, um, in terms of the ads and everything else, you have to strike back like that. Otherwise, you look like, you know, you're kind of a lame yeah. player. Yeah, and I that, but I just, some of these facts should have come out, like, uh, loud and clear, because that could have been negative in its own connotation. Yes. 88 Hello, reports. yes, Hello. and we can quote the book right. and tell people to read it. So I have an idea. Still we still that. have time. Yeah. So why don't I do a Facebook thing or and link why there. don't we get or something, get go. this information out there and the telephone numbers of all the major networks and say, where are you guys? 
Why aren't you pointing this out? This is your responsibility for the media because, you know, the president shouldn't do this at this point because then he looks like he's weak and he's whining. Well, 88 guys were against me. You know, we have to get to the media on this. So back to Maureen's point. Um, let me get the phone numbers of the major networks and let's barrage them with as many intelligent, articulate, powerful phone calls from all of us that say, how about it? And, you know, it's been on my mind to call the author of this book saying, where are you? Why aren't you out there? Mm -hmm. So I will pledge to all of you that I will do that, too. Because if you got on Facebook and you put these kind of statistics out, okay. if everybody was able to... See it. The link to you. Okay. Go on NPR. Yeah. Well, listen, I need an agent. So if somebody <laughs> will, I'm serious because I have made some calls and I feel, I feel very awkward doing it, you know, promoting myself. But if one of you were to say, okay, I'm going to call NPR. Let's get you on there. Let's get you talking. I'm happy to do it. I'm well, ready. I don't want you to change that attitude. Sorry to be so forceful. Oh. But you need to be promoting yourself. People need to hear that. <laughs> if I may, yeah. MSNBC is always looking for people like you who have been Republicans, who have converted, if just for this vote, and why. Okay. And I, I would actually say if you simply made a call to that. Well, I would love to de delegate that to all of you. Make a call and say, please call Claudine Schneider. I mean, tell the, tell the media to call me because... Um, I've done it a few times, and I've gotten nowhere. Mm -hmm. But if somebody, you know, they think I'm self-promoting. What's your number? And, <laughs> uh, my number is 303-413-0182. But what we need to do is get the numbers, or I guess all of you can look those up. No, we everybody. Google. Google. Okay, Google. What did you say, too? We should probably. 413-0182. Right. Because you know. is in touch with. I mean, the, the woman that spoke at the NC Wit Summit from Washington, D.C., who was talking about Title IX and that there's only been, what did she say, two, uh, two cases brought up against Title IX that were based on education. I think the world thinks it's an athletic type of... of Wait a second. I can speak to that because I can tell you that when I was in office, I had an intern who was probably Madison's age who came to me and said, Congresswoman, uh, Orrin Hatch has legislation to um, defund or um, erase Title IX. And I said, well, what's Title IX? You know, and then I learned, and then I found out, oh my gosh, this would not only affect women, this would affect minorities, the elderly, yeah, the yeah. disabled, entitlement to education, to all of this, everybody. for everybody. So if you look it up, I introduced the Civil Rights Restoration Act, and we passed it. But it was a Republican senator that I met with, and I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, we don't need that. I said, now look, if you move forward on this, I'm going to introduce a bill that will be much more comprehensive than yours because we can't mess around with civil rights. You know, too many people gave their lives and worked too hard to move us this far. We cannot move backwards. So, you know, we passed that. But I didn't know there's something going on now with Title IX. So, well, it, was, it was really just an awareness. It was, and, and the woman works, I think, for Obama somewhere. Well, one of the things that I can tell you, though, is that you probably have seen Donna Brazil on television. She and I did a TV show because she is a beneficiary of Title IX. Um, and when I'd introduced the bill, the television station, whichever one it was, wanted to interview somebody who, you know, was a beneficiary and, and me about what would my legislation do. So um, that's that. Some other questions? Suggestions? Let's mobilize, ladies. <laughs> I have a question. This is Mary and Charlotte, and I was just wondering what you think would be the um, what do you think would be the best campaign reforms that we could uh, institute to change the voice of uh, the campaigns? Well, that's a very good question, and I have to, I'll tell you that uh, in the 80s, I was put on one of the first task forces appointed by the Democratic leader. He put Democrats and Republicans, bipartisan to look at campaign finance reform. And I was 
a freshman. I was new. I listened to the older guys and watched. But as the conversation started moving, it was like, wow, it looks like we're going to get campaign finance reform. We'll have limits on contributions, on where you can put the money. It's a, and then, much to my dismay, the last meeting that we had and the press was waiting outside the Democrat winked at the Republican, the Republican winked at the Democrat, and the press conference said we couldn't come to an agreement. And I just slipped away. I didn't want any part of it. But the reason is, is that the way it is now, uh, campaign financing favors the incumbent. And so you're not going to see that, co that change coming from the sitting members of Congress unless they are altruistic or strong proponents of good governance. Mm -hmm. And every day they're falling by the wayside. Senator Luger, Olympia Snow, you know. You, they're, they're getting beat down. They're getting beat down. So it is, so what, I mean, what I do for a living is strategy. And for me, I would think that the best strategy would be to work with some of the nonprofits, um, one of whom approached me a while ago to do this um, campaign to reverse Citizens United. Citizens United allows anybody to spend money on political campaigns and say anything they want, truth or not. And I said, well, here's they said, how would you approach this if we hire you? And I said, well, first of all, I'd get Republicans on board because I know some moderate Republicans who have big names, and if we show that it's a bipartisan effort but we start with Republicans, then we have a chance of moving this along. And I would also go to corporations because I enlisted 50 corporations to reduce their greenhouse gases, including uh, companies like... Um, Coors and Roche and a bunch of others, and I said, we get these CEOs to work with us since this allows for corporate <coughs> donations, but we get them to be the good corporations and say they're, that we are against Citizens United, and these guys chose not to select me as the person running the campaign. They said that they were going to work with Ben and & Jerry's and small businesses and um, work with the Democrats and... You know, we see how far that has gotten, so I'm disappointed. But let me mention one other thing about money. Because of Citizens United, right now, and this was, I'm quoting from USA Today, August 24th, they did a whole big st story about the billionaire brothers. And these are Charles and David Koch, Koch, Koch. excuse me, Koch. Each have nearly 10 times the money amassed by Oprah Winfrey. Um, and it says this election could change that as the conservative mega donors ramp up political activity and set out to influence the election to help their bottom line. They have a combined net worth that Forbes pegs at $50 billion, and they control the Kansas-based Coke Industries, which operates refineries, chemicals, asphalt, pipelines, and a wide range of consumer products. Well, I can tell you that a former staff person of mine took on the Koch brothers in California when they decided to eliminate a state um, legislation, AB 32, having to do with climate change. And I'm happy to report that the environmental community won, despite all of the big dollars. And that legislation has Stayed, but it was a bloody battle with tons of ads. Now, we are being overwhelmed with a lot of negative ads against the president, and I happen to think that we Americans can show that money cannot buy elections, that we are going to turn out the vote. We're going to you know, do whatever it takes in terms of you know, making sure our kids have voted, our mothers, and this and that, and... Um, you know, I've chosen to vote all Democrat because the Republicans no longer represent my values. Yes, I have values of less government. Yes, I have support for reducing the deficit, but not the way the Republicans want to do it. And I am saying this not based on what Mr. Romney has said because he hasn't been clear whether it's the mortgage home deduction or whether it's, you know, student aid deductions. I'm saying this based on my personal experience of 10 years hanging out with the boys. 
who kept saying, we got to eliminate the Department of Education. And, and Rick uh, Perry, you know, from Texas, he even said in the Republican primary, as did many of the others, you know, we need to eliminate some of these agencies to reduce the deficit. Um, I once even said, I look forward to the day when we no longer need an environmental protection agency, uh, when we get rid of the environmental protection agency and my environmental supporters freaked out, like, Claudine, have you lost your mind? And it was like, no. I was envisioning a day when corporations would do the right thing, when they would, you know, be conscious of the communities that they live in. And I'm happy to report that many of them now are going the extra distance and doing phenomenal things when it comes to greenhouse gases, energy use, promoting renewables, et cetera. Claudine, yes. question. Um, Kathy Kelly, and I represent Colorado Business Women here. Um, what's been interesting to me is how when I bring out maybe a fact, um, I'm being attacked uh, uh, religiously, I should say, from the religious right. And it's interesting how so many women um, seem to be threatened by some of the policies of President Obama. Have you experienced that, being called Satan? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I met him once. <laughs> I met him once. <laughs> um, well, I can tell you that um, the best way to deal with those kinds of attacks are lightly because remember who you are, you know, and remember who you're answerable to. You're answerable to God, you know, and to have other people judge you, what's that all about? And to call you names. And let me just say, you know, I was a Catholic congresswoman, and on certain Catholic holidays, the, the governor, the state legislator, all of us would go to church, and we were asked by the priest to sit in the front row until it was clear that I was pro-choice. And then he told me to sit in the back of the church, and he would not give me communion. I mean, there comes a time when we women have to find our backbone, and if you need the right answers, the right words, I'm here. I'll help you think it through, because we have to work as a community of women to support one another in all of this. And I also think that, um, you know, I did a press conference for the president in Colorado Springs, and um, the reporter said to me, well, it turns out that the president's son said that he wanted to um, hit Obama. And fortunately for this press conference, it was about the blue binders and everything, and there were a bunch of women behind me standing there holding signs for Obama. And I turned to the women and I said, ladies, how many of you are involved in making sure that your children aren't bullied in school? And they all put up their hands. And I turned to the reporter and I said, this is terrible modeling for our children, but I guess like father, like son, if you're going to bully, you know, um, you're going to bully. I certainly don't want that kind of president. Mm -hmm. So that just came to me. But I think we women need to have some answers for religious attacks. And my thing was, I mean, I always called it like I saw it. And a lot of these men who were constituents of mine, oh, my God, they were tough. But... The day that was my redemption was when this man came up to me and said, Claudine, I hate your position on abortion, but I trust you, and I'm going to vote for you because I trust you. And that's what we need to convey is if we speak the truth, people will start to trust us no matter what our position might be. And not all of my constituents agreed with all of my positions on different things. You know, sometimes I was beat up by the unions, other times I was embraced by them. But that's because I don't believe that any party is right all the time. Exactly. And that's why we do need two parties. But the Republican Party in this election is doing itself more damage. And I do not want to see fundamentalists in this country or in any country throughout the world fundamentalists who deny a woman a right to be a woman gain power, and this is what we must protect against as a collective. So we have to close, because we, um, we only have this room for this amount of time. 
I would love to um, get your email address if you're open. And also, I'd love to see this conversation go online. Um, if people have ideas, all of the women that I know that are involved in Moxie, as well as the women, women in this room, are really connected. And we should use that power for good and not evil, of course. So uh, we have your phone number. Could we get your email real quick if yes. you're open? Claudine.solutions at gmail.com. And we hope we'll be able to friend you on Facebook and keep the conversation going and see what kind well, of ideas we can come up with. Okay, but keep in mind, I do not do Facebook now. I'm only okay. going to do this for this purpose. Okay. Um, I have a million emails with, with work and everything else as it is, so I may not get to everybody. But, you know, not. if we can do some form of connection and I can put information out there that will be the tools for all of you That's to exactly use, it. then we will and succeed. We need <laughs> and, and this is a place just to get it out to a community people. Great. It's about new information you see that we may not come up against. Okay. And how we can use that for good and to get to our network. Got it. Okay. All right, ladies. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. You are very welcome.